Thank you. Thank you, Mark the Korean, and uh, wonderful singing. <laughs> uh, let me see if I. Okay, so um, good morning again. Welcome to Penang Bible Church. Um, first announcement. We have only one announcement, which is the Friday Bible study is, I think we started last Friday. Um, at the uh, waterfront, which is uh, David's house. David's not here today? Okay. Um, so it says that uh, every Friday, 7 p.m., and we just started a new series after finishing... Uh, Revelation, I think, last, last, last session. So this, this session is about Paul's ministry concerning the special revelation given to Paul about Gentile living today in the age of grace. So it's relevant in the sense that we're all Gentiles. I think we should uh, learn about that and in the age of grace. Um, so it's important to uh, uh, join this Bible study. I, how many people turned up last Friday? Jigeren. Um, uh, so there were like 16 and almost like less than 20 uh, congregating at David's house. So it's a wonderful uh, Bible study and encourage everyone to join. So kids are dismissed. Uh, end of this uh, announcement. Okay. So, okay. So, um, I was given a sermon title, Opposing Bad Kings. But, uh, uh, so it's about kings. So I, I chose this topic because uh, I did a sermon on First Kings and also uh, Israel history. So I was like, you know, kind of like wanting to do another one on kings. Uh, but before I start, uh, I, the last, uh, last two sermons I, I gave, I talk about our king, you know, Malaysia has kings, and uh, I shared, like, how do you, what do I consider as good kings, right? So, what I shared last time, a good king is where they come and share a meal with us. He comes down to a regular restaurants and eat among uh, common people like us. So, this is uh, taken in a restaurant in Penang, in Campbell Street. Um, so this is a, a previous king. Our current king uh, just visited China. So we are like, oh wow, okay. So uh, another way, that another way I see good kings are they build bridges and be friendly with neighbors, um, foster relationship with uh, uh, neighbor, neighboring countries, and so I think that's also another uh, uh, what I to, to, to in my opinion. Uh, good kings, and in the Bible, in in Bible, there are few kings uh, considered good kings who also did the same, who are that diplomatic and form allies with the neighboring uh, 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 countries. Like uh, King Esa was one. Uh, I think King Manasseh is also another one who built very good alliance with uh, the neighbors. So these are good kings. Another another thing I think he's this this is a good king is because. His uh, grandmother, uh, Tai San, this is in Tai Shan in China. His uh, grandmother, uh, this king, current king, his grandmother apparently is from China. And uh, the, the grandmother came from a part of China, Tai San, uh, in, Guang, in, in Guangzhou. And uh, I get very excited about this because Tai San is also where my ancestors came from. So, um, so I'm also a Thai Chinese or Thai San Ren, uh, so uh, almost in Chinese. Uh, so, so I'm Thai Chinese, I speak Thai Shan dialect, and of course quickly I go into searching where is the village where his, his majesty's grandmother came from. So apparently the village is just like half an hour away from my ancestor's village. So not quite, but I think it's close enough. Uh, so last year, me and my family went to visit Tai San. We went to the ancestors' village, and next month, um, 
Next month, I'm going back again to Taishan because there is a worldwide global, uh, my surname is Moi, uh, worldwide global Moi's clan conference. Can you imagine? So all the Sing uh, All the Moi's are coming back to Taishan to congregate and have a conference. I, I'm quite excited about it, uh, but my wife is not. She, she's like, she's not into this uh, uh, ancestry thing. What has it got to do with today's uh, sermon? Uh, nothing actually, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that I like to share about myself. You know, my, my, my. My, I remember my first sermon I shared about my family and our background. So this is part of it. But anyway, today's sermon, responses to God's message during bad times. Um, so we are still on the series of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah as a, as a prophet uh, during um, the, 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 the end of uh, uh, Judah's kingdom. And we're going to go through that. Um, covering uh, Jeremiah chapter 22 to 39. Um, what we need to learn today is King's response, uh, people's response, and our response. So Jeremiah goes around uh, uh, prophesying in, uh, towards the uh, final uh, uh, few kings in, in Judah. And we want to <coughs> analyze and understand uh, what does it tell us in terms of uh, responses to, to God's messages. So, um, so let me pray before we get into the sermon actual. Dear Father God, thank you for bringing us here back here again, uh, including visitors and, and also people that are here every Sunday. I uh, also pray for those who are traveling. Father, we just pray that uh, you continue to give me um, uh, your speech uh, to deliver this sermon. And this speech is uh, just coming from you. And I pray that you bring clarity and confidence in us, in us. Uh, in you and uh, Father, we just pray that whatever we uh, learn today, it comes from you, and we continue to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Uh, amen. All right. So, so these are the outline of what we want to learn today. So, very briefly, I showed it man, this many times because I want to give the context of of the sermon. Uh, these are all the kings in Israel and Judah, and we are talking about Jeremiah's time, which is the final five kings. Uh, during uh, Israel's uh, history. So that's uh, King Josiah until the last one, Zedek Zedekiah. Um, what, does, what does the Bible say about good and bad king? Uh, uh, two sermons ago, I also talked about the same thing, but it was more on other kings. But this one, specifically for the five kings, in, in the Bible, it always says, right, the good kings, it always says the did. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, second Kings, and it, it talks about many other kings uh, in that, in that uh, 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 view. And the bad kings is always did evil in the sight of the Lord. So you can see Second Kings, Second Chronicles, they all talk about uh, uh, th these two types of kings. And, and it's very clear who are the good and who are the bad kings. And in Jeremiah's time, uh, there are five kings, Josiah, and then Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And Josiah is known as a good king because he, he found the book of the law and he, he did a revival uh, of Judah. And uh, so he, 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 he get everyone to turn back to God, uh, but he may not be so um, uh, uh, complete in that sense, but he's considered a good king and he, he went to fight in, uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, he died there, but uh, he was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. So he has a, he's a good, good ending. Now the bad kings, Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz, um, he, did, he died and never returned to homeland. So he has a bad ending. Jeho Jehoiakim, he was buried like a donkey. That's mentioned in the Bible. That's not a good thing to be <laughs> recorded in a, in, a, in a book of history. Uh, Jehoiachin, uh, none of his descendants shall prosper. That was a prophecy on, on this king. So, no good. Uh, Zedekiah, uh, he's the last king in Judah before Babylon, uh, ba the Babylonians uh, took over. And his son was killed and his eyes was gouged. 
that that is really a terrible ending for this king because before he died he saw his son was killed two sons were killed before his eyes were gouged out so the only memory of him before he lost his eyesight is actually witnessing the death of his his son so these are not so good kings uh, uh, jo, uh, jo, these two uh, Jehoahaz and Jehoahaz Jehoahachin uh, I just call it Ahai, Akim and Achin this is a local 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 context uh, they are ve- they, these two are very short range so there's not much record of, of these two kings but the major ones are jo- Josiah Jehoiakim and Zedekiah some context there so another background is uh, about Jeremiah, uh, his uh, journey delivering God's message. So today we talk about uh, the kings, the environment, God's message and how it's delivered. So how did uh, Jeremiah deliver his God's, God's message during his uh, uh, ministry? Uh, if you remember, uh, he had a divine calling in Jeremiah, uh, chapter 1, verse 5. God called him. And he said, uh, I'm too young, I cannot speak. And that's how God, God called him and God showed him uh, the almond branch, uh, saying that uh, I'm, I'm there with you all the time, uh, don't be afraid. So he started, his, he started his ministry during Josiah's 13th year of reign. So, so he started halfway through Josiah's, King Josiah's uh, uh, as, as king. Uh, he started, uh, it's recorded in uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Uh, he witnessed the fall of King Zedekiah, the last king. So, um, Jeremiah is the, the only prophet who prophesied about uh, Judah and, and experienced, and he himself went through uh, the end of, 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 of Judah. So he's, he's, he's also known as a weeping prophet because he prophesied about, uh, you know, this is going to happen, this is going to, the bad things are going to happen if we don't repent. And he actually saw and experienced himself the whole process. So he's, 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 he's a unique prophet uh, in that sense. And he, in the end, he was taken to Egypt. Uh, there was a rebellion uh, group of people in Judah uh, and escaped and took uh, uh, Jeremiah um, away uh, with them. So um, Jeremiah 43 uh, recorded how he, he ended his uh, uh, ministry. So this is about uh, Jeremiah and his uh, journey. So if you ever wonder how does God's message is delivered to, to the king, to the people, and eventually to us, right? So, how was the messages delivered to, from Jeremiah to the kings? Do you think that Jeremiah approached every king and talked to them? Actually, no. Um, Josiah, how he... Josiah actually never really consulted with Jeremiah. Josiah consulted actually a prophetess a woman, a, a lady prophet uh, called ha- Huldah, recorded in Second Kings uh, chapter 22. Uh, Huldah, the prophetess, actually prophesied the same thing as Jeremiah. That means if you don't repent, if you don't change your way, uh, bad things going to happen, that the Babylonians going to take over uh, Judah. So uh, Huldah actually um, um, uh, gave the same message to Josiah, but Josiah did not really d- have direct contact with uh, Jeremiah. Jehoahaz, it was not cited. His uh, Jehoahaz was only like three months, very short reign. It was not recorded how Je- Jeremiah uh, um, delivered the message to to him. Jehoiakim, he the message was delivered to him in a scribe in a scroll. So um, one day this uh, one day in uh, in. Jeremiah 26, God asked Jeremiah to write down all the things that God has said. So Jeremiah asked Baruch, a scribe, to write down on a scroll. And this scroll was read out to Jehoiakim, and he actually burned, burned the scroll. So that was the res- response from a king. 
So it was, so Jehoiakim received it in a in a written scroll and and read out. Jehoiachin, there's no direct account of direct uh, uh, delivery of the message. Zedekiah was read out at first, and he imprisoned Jeremiah. And later on, Zedekiah actually have a private meeting with Jeremiah, and this is a, a Zedekiah is the one clear incident uh, where. Uh, Jeremiah actually have direct conversation with Zedekiah. Uh, unfortunately, he's the last king, and uh, he he did not uh, change his way, and uh, uh, Judah still ended up being taken over by Babylon. So, so Josiah uh, talked to uh, the prophetess uh, Jehoiakim, have a uh, 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 had a scroll read out, and Zedekiah had a verbal conversation. So these two are the key. These two are the kings where there's a direct uh, God's uh, delivery of God's uh, message. So these are the five kings during Jeremiah's. So have you under, ever wondered how God delivered his message to you? I always say the like, first thing is maybe WhatsApp, right? So, but, then, but then if God were to send you a message in WhatsApp, it would be an uh, unknown sender or, you know, when you receive a call. Uh, so, I, so I really, yeah, I can't underestimate that, but I think uh, when you receive WhatsApp messages, you have, be, have to be careful. But the main message that you, for us, people like us, to receive God's message is still through the Bible. So the uh, Bible is still the most reliable source of uh, messages that comes from God. So regardless of how it was delivered to the kings, but for us, it's still uh, the Bible. So what was God's message uh, in, in, in Jeremiah? The last um, sermon we had uh, on Jeremiah uh, chapter 5 uh, is about uh, how God asked uh, Jeremiah to go and find that one man. If you remember, go and find that one man. If you can find that one man who execute judgment and righteousness, I will spare the city. So this is how uh, uh, chapter 5 verse 1, verse one goes. Run, and, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See how and know and seek in her open places if you can find a man. If there is anyone who executes judgment and who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. So this is God's message that uh, God wants Jeremiah to deliver to the people. Ask him to go and find this one man who executes judgment and seeks the truth. So Jeremiah went out to the open space. He cannot find anyone. He go and search. He, he want to go uh, to the more educated people, go and went, went to see the priest and uh, uh, other prophets, and he cannot find, and in the end, he could not find a single person who does that. So that was an instruction and message to, uh, from God through uh, Jeremiah. And the last sermon I ended with, there's one thing in chapter 5 that at the end of chapter 5 uh, is the prophet's, Prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own power, and my people live, love it or love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? So the last verse of chapter five is asking for a response, right? So response from the prophet, response from the priest, and response from the people. So it ended with uh, this warning and uh, um, uh, request for response from everyone who hears the, the message. And it repeats again uh, the chapter 5 message in Jeremiah 22, verse 1 to 4. Um, Patrick showed this two Sundays ago when he talks about um, widows and, and uh, orphans. And, um, so, so this is uh, Jeremiah 22, verse 3. Another similar message, a repeat message from God to the people. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness. Similar. And this time he has a specific instruction. Deliver the plundered out of the hand of the oppressor. Do, not, do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. So God wants people to execute judgment and righteousness and also uh, to carry out this action, which is to deliver the 
the oppressed, the weak, the widows. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. So this is the reward. So if you, if you hear this message, you obey this, if you do this, and this is what you get as a, as a reward. So again, God sent a very clear message, a repeated message to the people to execute judgment and righteousness. And He wants us to respond. So let's go into uh, the each responses, the kings, how the king responded, right? Uh, because God wants, is, is asking for a response. How the people and the prophets responded and how we uh, how the people stated, uh, written in, in the Bible, how they responded, plus other people in other parts of the Bible, how they responded as well. So this is uh, Jehoiakim, and it happened when Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth, until all the scroll was consumed in fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of his servants who heard, who heard all these words in Jeremiah 36. So uh, I was saying uh, God asked Jeremiah in chapter 36 to write down uh, in a scribe. He asked Baruch, the scriber, to write it down. And, he, and the, scribe, the, 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 the scroll was read out to King uh, Jehoiakim. And what did he do? What was his response? His response to cut it in half and throw it and burn it. And, and yet the people who, who were there were not afraid. They, were, they, were, uh, um, they, they basically did not care what it says, right? So they are not afraid and they, they don't show remorse and they, they did not repent at all. So not a good response from a king uh, who actually ended up uh, as, a, as a bad king. And uh, Zedekiah, another king, what was his response? In Jeremiah 37, Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the baker's street until all the bread in the city was gone. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So when Zedekiah heard the message, he put Jeremiah in jail. So that's... Another response from a king, uh, we consider that he's, him as a bad king. Um, so, you know what they say about the uh, messengers? You know, basically, he, he wants to kill the messenger. So, um, the king, this Zedekiah, also did not respond well to, to God's messages. So, sometimes we hear that, you know, we worry about uh, well, it, what is God's messages. But when you hear it and you respond to it, it it's even more important than where it comes from. So what about people's response? Uh, I draw contrast uh, of two prophets written in uh, Jeremiah of their response to God's message. So um, Jeremiah's response, um, as for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you, Jeremiah 26. So he's basically submission. So he's basically submitted, submitted to God on, on, on what God wants to do. So remember when the, at the beginning when he was called, he would say, I'm young and I cannot speak. And then God said, don't worry. God showed him the uh, uh, almond branch and say, I'm always with you. And he started his ministry. Towards the end, the king still wants to imprison him and things are still not going right and the, the, the enemies are getting stronger and coming near to him. So he is like, you know, keep saying uh, God's word, delivering God's message, but still the kings did not respond well to his message. So in the end, he is like, okay, here I am in your hand. He's like submitting to God. He's done all he can. He's, he, I think he's, he's in jail, right? And he, he's just saying that, you know, all up to God right now. So he's, he, he, he did all his best, right, to respond to King's message. There was another... Uh, prophet during the same time uh, who also prophesied the same thing which is uh, destruction to the city uh, the other 
prophet, he is Urijah, son of Shemaiah. He, pro- he also prophesied against the city, but, uh, and then Jehoiakim also sought to kill him, but he fled. He, he, he ran away, he ran to Egypt, he was captured, brought back and killed. So uh, if you put con- in contrast with, with these two, right, Jeremiah and uh, Urijah, one say, okay, I've done all my best, I've done everything, uh, here I am, do what you, what, do what you want uh, with me. Uh, but Urijah basically abandoned his calling, right? So he said, ah, oh, uh, he, he prophesied and then he did what he has to do and he fled and eventually was killed. So a, a conclusion for him, he was, he's, he was fearful, uh, he was succumbing to fear and he basically abandons one's calling. So he, he tried to free, uh, 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 run away and thinking that uh, you know, uh, everything would... Uh, he would escape everything. So he did not end well, and he abandoned his uh, calling, and he was captured and killed. So we had the king's response. You know, Jehoiakim burned and cut the scroll, uh, and then we had Zedekiah who imprisoned uh, Jeremiah. We had the prophet, uh, uh, the Jeremiah submission, Urijah abandoned his calling. So what about the people around who heard the messages. What did he? How did they respond? So um, there's this um, official in the court called Ab- Abed Malak. So he's an Ethiopian, a foreigner in in the king's uh, circle of people. He he res- so he is basically a, a, a foreigner in 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 that area. And Patrick talked about how we look at foreigners in this country, the migrant workers and things like that. So he, you can imagine he is one of those people. And, but of course he is an official in, in, the, in the court. So he rescued Jeremiah. Um, he actually executed the rescue. Uh, he planned and organized the resources and the people around and to go and rescue um, Jeremiah, there are more details. There's quite a lot of details actually in, uh, recorded in, in Jeremiah 38. And his intervention saved uh, Jeremiah from death because Jeremiah was thrown into a cistern. Cistern is basically, you know, everything is thrown inside and it's dark and it's wet. And you, if you stay there, you will just die of, of hunger. And basically when, when uh, the first time uh, Jehoiakim imprisoned Jeremiah, he was thrown in the cistern. He was meant to die in the system. Um, but uh, Abed Melech, a foreigner, came and rescued uh, Jeremiah. So he was, he was saved, uh, Jeremiah. So it was faith and bravery, uh, how I would characterize uh, Abed Melech, uh, the Ethiopian. And he's standing up to justice and righteousness because I, I, I could assume he is one of those who heard the readout of the scroll around uh, King uh, Zedekiah. So he, he responded by uh, rescuing Jeremiah uh, with faith and uh, bravery. So that's one response from in, in Jeremiah. In other parts of the Bible, there are also um, less, significant, less significant people who responded to uh, God's message. Uh, if you can remember uh, Abigail, Nabal's wife, um, when King David came and, and uh, Nabal was very rude to King David, they, all, they almost had a conflict. And uh, it's recorded in 1 Samuel, Abigail came out and um, uh, mediated and uh, the, the, there was, uh, she, what do you call that? She, she allayed the conflict. So they, it ended up, because Nabal is a very bad-tempered man, right? And King David is with his army. So if, if uh, Abigail did not go out and mediate, there could be a, a fighting and war. So uh, uh, a wife uh, in the family, uh, uh, a role that she plays, uh, actually averted a major uh, fighting uh, between two, two, um, uh, two parties. So Abigail responded by... Uh, 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 executing good judgment. 
Another part of uh, Bible, if you remember way back in Exodus, Sifra and Pua, Pua's moral choices. Um, Sifra and Pua's are Hebrew midwives. They were delivering babies, if you remember the story. And uh, the Pharaoh wanted to kill all the male uh, babies. And the midwives um, uh, uh, planned together and, uh, and did not uh, kill all the babies. So first thing they responded was uh, not to obey Pharaoh's uh, instruction. The second part is when they were, if you remember, when they were uh, questioned, you know what did they say? They say uh, the babies came out too fast until they cannot carry out the, the, the plan, right? So the two times, uh, Sifra and Puas, just a uh, Midwife, you know, uh, people don't really, you know, uh, uh, give them too much uh, 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 highlights, right? So they are one of those people who just do their job. Um, you can think of peop hospital workers, you can think about uh, teachers, you can think about social workers, and they are all out there um, uh, executing uh, judgment and uh, uh, showing uh, moral, moral choices. So these are another not so significant people in the Bible. Other parts of the Bible that I can find is Tabitha's selfless service and faith. Tabitha, anyone remember who Tabitha is? Any, any impression? I think he was uh, resurrected as well. So she, so Tabitha has is also known as Dorcas. So she is, she has two names, right? He has a Aramaic name and a Hebrew name, right? Uh, so she, she, she is known for making clothing for poor people and the widows, demonstrating commitment to helping to those in need in the city of Joppa. Uh, sorry, I did not uh, translate this. Boy, it's not male, but it's got funny. So Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, so. She, she reminds me of a people like, like pe local people like us, right? We, ha we are uh, local, Malays Malaysian, Penang, and there are foreigners coming in and they, they have two names so that they can easy, easily communicate and uh, mix with the, the foreigners. So, so Tabitha had two names and so that he can uh, uh, mingle with the foreigners in the city. So Jopa is a city where there's a lot of people come, come and go. So she helped um, the poor and the widows. So remember uh, Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 3, right? Uh, deliver the oppressed and uh, protect the poor and the, and the widows. So Tabitha is one good example of uh, uh, executing good judgment. There are other Characters in the Bible, uh, the Good Samaritans in Luke, in Luke, Esther, and Rahab. So there are many examples of how people respond to uh, God's, judge, uh, God's message. So that would pretty much relate to us. Because we are also not significant in the Bible history. So in today's society, I'll move on to what can we do as, as a normal, common people, right? So in today's society, uh, in terms of uh, helping in social justice, um, you can be community helpers, healthcare workers, teachers and educators, volunteers in crisis situation, uh, social enterprise, business as mission. Um, so there are many, many um, options or callings to, uh, to, to all of us who receives uh, God's message. I would, I would, um, I would particularly focus on social enterprise and business as mission, uh, because I think it really has the element of executing judgment and uh, deliver the op the the plundered and help the strangers and fatherless and widows. Um, some of you may know that uh, me and my wife sell honey, right? So me and my wife have this micro business and we sell honey. We got uh, the honey from Nepal and we sell it uh, locally. And, and it's, it's a social enterprise. Uh, it's part of what we call business as, mi as mission. 
um, last week we had missions week, right? So we talked about sending missions out to foreign land and and uh, uh, from things to come mission. Uh, I think uh, Ben and Nathan and Troy also shared with us what is the ministry about. That is sending missionary, right? So today I, I touch a little bit on business as mission. Uh, it's just because uh, I have a little bit of experience and I'm just sharing some personal uh, journey and experience in this uh, aspect. So what is business as mission? It's a holistic mission that means it combines secular and spiritual uh, activities together. It doesn't separate the two. Uh, it's a kingdom business. You do it all because of God's calling. Of uh, um, you do it with uh, with all your hearts and soul and strength and mind, right? And serve the others, serve your neighbors. Another element of business as mission is profit. It has to be profitable. Uh, not all missions are uh, charity in nature or voluntary in nature. It can be also a, a business where you can run and it also helps in, in the mission. Uh, what, it is, what it is not is business as mission is not, a work, is not a workplace ministry. Workplace ministry is like you work in a company and you be a witness to the non-believers. So this is also a mission, but it is not uh, business as mission per se. Right? It's also a ministry, but it's just different. Uh, it's different from tent making. Tent making is like those uh, bivocational pastors, they have work uh, to support themselves and they also do the ministry uh, as pastoring. And it's different from business, business for mission. Business for mission is like you do business, you earn profit and you donate to your, to your mission. Right? So, uh, so, it is, so business as mission is not the same as business uh, for mission. Uh, I will go into uh, some background of uh, the social enterprise that we, we have started and it has to do with Nepal, right? So I give a little bit of background on, on Nepal and how, how we started and responded uh, to the calling. So Nepal, uh, no Nepal. So, you, so many of you come across uh, Nepalese in this, this area. The, most of them are security guards. But um, this is a data from Joshua Project. Uh, Joshua Project uh, tracks how the how many of Nepali are reached. I mean, how much uh, the gospel has reached to the people in various countries. This, Nepal is just one of them. So uh, there is a data to say uh, 40, almost 42 percent of them are not reached out of a, a population of. Oh, this is world population, sorry. World population is 8 billion, 42 not rich. And in Nepal, it's 42% not rich. So there are 7,000 people group in Nepal, which is totally unrich. That means they are not even accessible. They haven't heard of the gospel. They do not know what Christianity is. And only 3,000 are, are, are rich. Are rich. And so if you look at overall in the world in need, uh, there are 90 percent worst unrich people consists of 80 percent of world's poorest population. That means those people who are not reached, they are eight, they consist of 80 percent of the poorest uh, in the world. And uh, most of them, 30 to 80 percent are unemployed. So employment is a, is a major thing in those countries because of the uh, economic uh, um, lack of development, right? So these are, these are overall, in general, people who are unreached and how they are poor. And in, so in, in Joshua Project, if you're not familiar, they also maps out where are the people who are unreached. This is Nepal. Uh, north of Nepal is Tibet, China. South is India. And you can see there's a open, it's landlocked and it has an open border with India. And uh, behind it is blocked by the Himalayan mountain range. So Nepal is a very uh, difficult, geographically difficult uh, 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 country to develop as a whole. 
so the progress in terms of uh, reaching them is in red, which is uh, still majority is not reached. Um, so population unreached is 90%. There are 27 million people in Nepal still haven't heard about uh, the gospel. So now it comes to the background of how we started MahaWorks. MahaWorks is a company that we started uh, and we sell honey. It all started with um, uh, our response to a crisis in Nepal. In 2015, there was a major earthquake in Nepal, uh, 7.3, 7.8, and uh, we went there to visit the place. Uh, it's slightly uh, uh, this area is called uh, Gorka, if you are familiar with Nepal. So in Gorka is the uh, epicenter of, of the earthquake. So we went there to take a look, to do a survey, and see what we can help. So these are the ruins in that area. This is actually in probably like uh, just right outside the Gorka. Um, total ruin after the earthquake. Uh, this is a school uh, in the area that we visited. You can see the roof is gone and there is this blackboard, we call it blackboard, uh, uh, remaining there. And it's just the whole school is just totally ruined and you cannot... The, the kids were having classroom somewhere else at the, at the riverside and the whole school is just, just ruined. And we continue to survey the area and we decided that the, how, how we started uh, Maha Works as a social enterprise is uh, because we, we, deci we, we decided that uh, uh, by giving them money, donation doesn't really help. If you, you, give, you give them money to build school, you do not know where the money goes and you never really see the school or hospital built. So we dis what we decided was to uh, give them bee houses and that's how it started. So we, we gave bee houses to the Nepali there so that they can create a livelihood. Um, so, this is, so this is just an impact snapshot of what what it, uh, Maha Works has done. So Maha Works is a, is a social enterprise responding to call God's message to, to call and calling to respond to the people who are stricken with the disaster. Um, so you, uh, this is uh, Alvin. Uh, he, he's, he's, you know, he's carrying, uh, I think this is 27 kg honey. So if you want to carry the honey, it's right up in the mountain. It's about uh, 1,200 uh, meters elevation. To carry this one, one barrel, uh, it takes about, for us, I think it would take about four or five hours. Um, so it's really hard work for them uh, to, 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 to do that. So we help them in terms of how we can improve productivity. Um, and this is a family, one of the families that we, we, uh, we help. Um, this guy is Raj Kumar. He's, he actually died of accident halfway through us helping him in, in this. So what we what Maha Works is, is doing is we uh, if we if you hear of any migrant workers Nepali returning back to to Nepal, uh, we tell them go back to Nepal, don't come back again, uh, because we want them to join the family and be with the family. So we say, okay, if you're interested in beekeeping, not all of them likes beekeeping. Some of them likes to repair motorcycles. Some of them uh, wants to sell chicken. Some of them wants to plant tomatoes. So it's, it's all different. So those who, who wants to um, do beekeeping, we give them free uh, bee houses together with worker bees and queen bees, right? And we calculated if you give one, one person seven bee houses, he can sustain his livelihood for a year. And, it's, and, and beekeeping is a very nice thing. You can put the bee houses aside. Uh, the, bee, the worker bees will, are your workers. They work for you. So it's a passive income. So the man can still go and do farming and do coffee and whatever uh, while the bees are working and collecting uh, ne nectars and, uh, 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 you know, and uh, you can harvest honey from there. So it's a very nice uh, combination. We, uh, we, we were deciding between show and this and, and coffee, I think. So we decided honey is probably the easiest. So we have uh, uh, given out ATB houses and we have harvested, harvested eight tons of honey. So this is 24 kilogram, right? So 
we have actually harvested 8,000 kilograms. 8,000 kilograms is, uh, what's the weight of a Land Cruiser? Or it's probably like about 3,000 3, kilograms uh, for a for four-wheel drive. So we're talking about like almost three uh, uh, four-wheel drive. Um, so, so, so these honey, when they, when they, when we buy from them, actually help them in terms of uh, their livelihood. And we're supporting about seven uh, families. Other things that we've done, um, uh, Baha Works has done uh, the earthquake earthquake release. This guy, he's called Roshan Roshan Gurung. He used to work in a Sony factory in Penang, and one day he decided he wants to go back to Nepal to take care of his aging mother. So he, we said, okay, you go back, what are you going to do? He said, don't know. So I said, we give you bee houses. He went back, uh, so he got the bee houses, and he, he was a churchgoer in Penang. So there is um, Sangatis. Right? Sangatis are a small church for the Nepali, and we have trained uh, a lot of uh, ne Nepali migrant workers and uh, introduced uh, gospel to them. And we do not want them to go back to Nepal and then cannot earn a living and then go to Middle East. You know? So then we'll lose them. So we want to make sure that they go back and we make sure that they have a livelihood. And he actually started a small group. And today he has a church. Actually, we saw the picture. I don't have it. Uh, about 10 to 12 young people in his village. Um, so, so Roshan is doing well uh, as a good example of how we supported him. This, these are the bee houses that we give to the people and we work with uh, the local contacts in, in, in Nepal. And recently we built a, we call it community hall, but you, you, you can't really see there's a cross outside the wall. Um, this community hall is located in a village called Chepang, Chepang Village. And um, the Chepang tribe, uh, if you Google them, they are really low class in, low in caste for, 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 the, for the Hindus. And because they were nomadic, they, they moved around, they were nomad before. So when they settle, eventually they settle very far away from each other. So in the, in the, in the, in the mountain area, there are like about 50 children, and they are all scattered very far away from each other. So we, 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 we saw the, a need of having a community hall where the children could come and gather together. So if they gather together, it's easy to teach them and educate them and things like that because they were staying so, so far away from each other. So we, so we work with them. Uh, we... They, they did the wall, we donated the, 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 the roof, uh, they did the carpet, we donated for toilet, I think. So, so this is running right now and it's now running as a church in that, in that area. Uh, other things that, uh, that has been done, uh, as remember social enterprise is a business as mission, we also need to be profitable and we, some of the profits we channel back to help them. Uh, this is helping the beekeepers on uh, quality improvement. We send them a uh, refractometer. I'm not sure you're familiar with that. It can tell the moisture content of honey. So for honey, very important, you want to control the quality from the source. Uh, sounds like I'm doing some selling, but I'm not. I'm just sh uh, sharing with you how we try to improve their, the the the. the honey production over there. And this, is, uh, this lady is Sanika Chopang. She is a good example of how, we, how it can, uh, livelihood can reunite the family. Her husband was working in India for many years and uh, he's, she started beekeeping and the business doing very well and the husband moved back to, 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 back to the village with her and, and they started uh, expanding the beekeeping activities. And the good thing is that you know, husband and wife are together and they are, they are in a family right now. And we also do some local community project. So um, this is one way that we can respond. You don't necessarily have to start a business to respond, right? But uh, we decided this is a, a calling and we, there were opportunities that we never thought of. You know, when God calls you and, 
you know, for me, I've never been to Nepal and I never started a business and I do not know anything about beekeeping. And somehow, when we arrive at Nepal, uh, we meet entomologists. You know, entomologists are people who, who are very familiar with insects and bees. We meet uh, local carpenters who can make bee houses. And we have no idea. If you ask me you know, where to find carpenters in Nepal, I have really no idea. And we meet people who rear uh, workers' bees and, and queen bees, and they, they can sell. Um, so when you answer to a God's calling, uh, God opens the door and everything will fall in place. And uh, today I can talk about honey for two, three hours and nonstop. Previously, I know nothing about, about, about honey. <coughs> Um, so we talk about responding to God's message, execute judgment and righteousness, and deliver the planet out of the hand of the oppressor. Um, main thing is uh, as, a, as, as a business and mission, we want to be salt and light to others. Let your light so shine before men and that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, this, this girl is one of the, it was taken maybe like seven, eight years ago. The father is the one who passed away, Rajkumar. Uh, today, I'm pretty sure she's a, she's a grown-up uh, right now. So we, we visited them together with... Um, this picture was very nice, taken by Jonathan Stefan. So she, he, he followed us. Uh, he took this picture, and uh, everyone loves this, this, this picture. So back to God's message and our response. Right? So just to wrap up, Kings respond. We saw the five bad, the four bad kings. Uh, one of them burned the scroll, and they were not afraid. Uh, there was Jehoiakim. Uh, Zedekiah put the messenger in prison. Um, the prophets respond. One of them abandoned the calling. One of them submitted. Uh, Jeremiah, and our response, people's response. We that we so we we talk about Abigail and uh, Tabitha and. People, normal people like us, could also respond uh, in a way that is honoring God, right? Uh, what is the God's message? Execute judgment, you know? uh, deliver the oppressed. So, speaking to every one of us, including myself, right? So, uh, how do you receive God's calling? How do you respond to God's calling? Um, it's something that you need. Really need. We we all really need to think about. Uh, it can be anything. It can be uh, wait, wait for a while. And I know a lot of people has done a lot of uh, good works. And so we really need to process this and and really know how to respond to what God wants us to do. And continue to listen, and uh, God would uh, lead the way and open the doors. But whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, as uh, mentioned in in Colossians. So I showed this. Almond branch uh, is significant. Uh, I didn't know there was an almond branch uh, because the flower looks like a plum blossom. But in Jeremiah uh, chapter, uh, <coughs> chapter 5, uh, when Jeremiah said, oh, I'm too young, I cannot, I cannot speak, God said, uh, what did you see? And then Jeremiah said, I saw an almond, almond branch. And then God said, yeah, that's because I'm always with you. I'm always uh, watching over you. Let us pray before we close the, the sermon. Dear Father God, thank you for today's uh, uh, message. Father, we, we uh, long for hearing from you. We long for uh, knowing what you have for us. And uh, we just pray that uh, whatever we hear, uh, your message, that we respond accordingly and godly and, and uh, of uh, pleasing to you. Uh, Father, we just pray that everything that we do, uh, whatever we respond, uh, it will come from you and that it uh, would uh, fulfill your will. Um, as we go today, we pray that you continue to have open ears, uh, that uh, we will he hear you, and that uh, wh whoever people that you send to us, whatever message that you, to you, you present to us, uh, let it be clear uh, to us that uh, we know how to ex respond exactly so that we glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, all right. <laughs> uh, next, we have a lot of supper. I'd like to invite uh, Rufus come to prepare uh, com uh, communion.
Um, while doing that, I invite Mark to come and uh, play some uh, background music. And after that, you are dismissed uh, after the communion. Thank you. Communion in our church may be a little different from those in other churches. It is called the Lord's table. It's not our table. Anyone who has accepted Jesus and considers him their savior is welcome to come and partake of this. It's just bread and some juice. It is actually the memorial of Jesus giving his life for us. On the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this, eat and do this in remembrance of me. And the same thing he did with the cup. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Whenever you drink this juice, just remember that this was what I had done for you, what I have done for you. So if you have actually accepted Jesus, you're most welcome to come. Take the bread. We will make two lines. We'll come on this side, which is my left, but your right. Make two lines. You can go back quietly. And then you just pray for a few minutes. Make yourself prepared for this time with God. I will pray. And then I will invite you. As soon as I leave, you're most welcome to come up. And then you may take your seats back. And Mark will then help us finish off after that. So let's just pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity when we can remember your sacrifice your love, and the forgiveness that we can enjoy every single day. Lord, we know that this is just bread and just uh, juice, but we remember the sacrifice that it took for you to save us. The blood that was shed, the body that was beaten, the body that was broken, the body that was spat upon, covered with thorns and blood, perspiration, pain and suffering. Lord, you took all our pain, our suffering, our sins and paid it all. Be with us now as we think about that sacrifice. Once again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to share in this communion. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, let's stand up together and we sing this song to proclaim that the Jesus is our King. Jesus, beautiful Savior. Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of majesty, risen King, Lamb of God, Holy. Name above every name. 
Thank you, everyone. Dismissed. I hope you have a good Sunday. <laughs>